Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, I'm excited to get into it. Um, my name is Sabine, and I will be moderating today's roundtable discussion. Um, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, I am a brown skin person with short, curly, dark hair, a backwards baseball cap, um, a blue short sleeve button down, um, and I'm in front of a white wall. You can see a little bit of uh, touching the edge of like a frame and a colorful chair. Um, I am uh, calling in from Piscataway land, the ancestral and occupied lands of the Piscataway nation and the Susquehanna, Lenape and Lumbee peoples have also cared for this land. Um, and I am the assistant to the artistic director at Baltimore Center Stage. Um, cool, so I'm just gonna frame a little bit before welcoming our incredible set of roundtable participants. Um, so we are gathered here today to reckon with and dream beyond the current state of pathways to entering our field and the current state of youths in the professional theater industry today. Um, as so many of us uh, are currently experiencing or have experienced recently or have experienced maybe less recently, uh, it's so often so difficult to find uh, and take up space as a young person in this industry. And when there is space made, it's most frequently temporary and fraught without agency and power, without security and resources, without centering our needs, our well-being, our vision. But it does not have to be that way. Um, and I think we are at this moment where we're starting to understand uh, some of the inequities inherent in these models that we built of like how we enter the field as young people. Um, and But we're still getting sort of stuck in the, this is how it's always been, or you have to do your time, or well, what, what do we do if we don't have uh, what internships, you know? Um, and so for that reason, I am so delighted to be joined today by this dope crew of brilliant fellow youths um, who I've already learned so much from and uh, I'm excited to dream alongside for the next hour or so. Um, cool, so I'm gonna ask folks to introduce themselves. Um, Great. Um, Matt, do you want to kick it off? Sure. I'm Matias Rafael Cardinale, but I usually just go by Maddie in English. Um, I am an emerging teaching artist. Um, I was born in Venezuela, but right now I am living in Seattle on, and I'm calling in from Seattle on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. I graduated very recently and I've been doing a lot of work in educational theater. Um, so that is where my theatrical specialty lies, but I've done a lot of other things in theater. I've done design, I've done some directing, I've done a lot of acting and I'm happy to do all of that again. Um, I am a brown skinned person with a mustache and beard, long wavy brown hair, um, relatively large eyebrows. Um, I'm wearing a white jacket and a gray patterned shirt. And I'm in front of a white space with a green curtain to my right. That's me. Thanks, uh, Albert. Hello, everyone. My name is Albert Lewis Wash II. I am, I'm calling from uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, the land of the Caddo. I currently serve as the co-founder and co co-founder and co-artistic director of Helianthus Annuous Theater Company. I am also the executive artistic producer for the Bishop Arts Theater Center. And recently uh, I'm a recent graduate uh, I graduated along with Zetra Goodlow, who's on this panel, last Saturday from Point Park University. I received my BA in theater arts with a minor in musical theater and a directing concentration. Uh, I'm an actor, director, um, playwright, um, entrepreneur, and you know I'm excited to be on this panel and to talk about these issues, you know, too often, you know, I um, realized, you know, during this pandemic that a lot, there's a lot of, um, you know, the older generation tends to 
you know, they tend to take from the younger generation because we have these new ideas, you know, and so one thing that really struck out with us um, that we that we're that we're doing that uh, we did this year is the uh, we Zetra and I are in advanced directing, and so we are do, we mainly you know we kind of mixed film with theater together because we didn't want to do no Zoom plays. We're sick of Zoom plays that we did not want to do that, and so you know that was just one way of just new and imaginative thinking to theater that um, that was really a highlight for me this year that um that you know young people i'm not saying we created it but we created that environment definitely in pittsburgh so that was um that was a really good game changer for all of us and yes thank you albert um i'm just going in order of who i see on my screen and so next up is may Hi everyone, my name is May Truhafzali. I go by she, her pronouns. I am a brown skinned woman with curly hair and glasses and I'm wearing a red shirt. And um, I'm calling in from uh, Jackson Heights, Queens, which is Muncie, Delaware, Matinecock land. And um, I am a current a uh, literary fellow at Playwrights Horizons. I am a former literary apprentice at Steppenwolf. I uh, am a playwright and a new play dramaturg and a director and just a general playwright advocate. Uh, Zetra. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Zetra Goodlow. Um, I am a brown skinned black woman. I have locks. I have a little pink sandy scarf on. I have a row of sunflowers behind me and I'm living it up. Um, <laughs> um, I am also like, like Albert said, I am the co-founder and co-artistic director of the Helianthus Annuous Theater Company. Um, I recently just graduated from Point Park University with my theater arts um, major and a minor in entrepreneurship and business. Um, I'm really excited to be in here. Uh, our last meeting with each other with these brand new mindsets, it, it was very refreshing for me just as a young person in the theater world. Sometimes when you go to art, art schools, you kind of just end up with just the people on the stage, if you know what I mean. So it was really nice to be with other people who want to create the world of theater, not just, you know, not just be on the stage. Um, but I'm really excited to get these ideas rolling and to get people to wake up and smell the roses. So yeah. Yes, roses. Um, and rounding us out, uh, Magdalene. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Magdalene Raleigh Lang. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am currently calling you from the ancestral homelands of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Menominee, Miami, and Sioux peoples. And I am in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I go to a Milwaukee public school here in the city. I am a junior at that school. Uh, I am a white skinned person with brown and gold glasses and blonde hair that is currently up in two low buns. I'm wearing a maroon v-neck shirt and behind me you can see my teal and gray bedroom walls and also a bookshelf with some assorted books. I'm joining you all today as the president of the teen council with the Milwaukee Repertory Theater and I'm also a member of the student advisory board with First Stage. So I'm involved in a couple different youth advocacy and youth leadership organizations in Wisconsin. Yay, uh, thank you so much, everybody. Um, incredible, let's get into it. Um, so I wonder uh, if we could start by doing a little uh, key term definitions. Um, so I'm thinking about the, the title of the panel, token use, um, and the use of the word token. Um, so I think the experience of being tokenized is something that we see across um, like lots of different identities and social categories and like as like a sort of key uh, 
element of the experience of marginalization. Um, and I so appreciate the use of that word here because um, it's it's not just uh, because it's systemic. I guess it points to this like systemic and structural like devaluing of young people's voices um, in in the industry, and um, the impacts of that sort of ripple out through all of our norms and practices and um, all the various things that make up our our beloved field. Um, and yeah, and we see that in like fellowships, internships, apprenticeships, these teen councils. Um, schools. Uh, and so I want to ask, um, what are your experiences? Um, if, if folks could share experiences of being the token youth and um, what can you share to help illuminate some of the ways that like tokenization has impacted um, your experience in the theater industry so far? Well, I, oh, go ahead, May. Go ahead. No, you go. Okay. Yeah. I know um, well for I know for me, uh, I as I said, I came from uh, Point Park. Zetra and I we come from Point Park University, and you know, along what I've experienced over the years, and what I've experienced over you know a lot of these um, big colleges, uh, drama colleges, is that they. They tend to look, they tend to run their college like a regional theater. So I know for a fact, like Point Park, um, you know, they showcase that they say we have diversity, they say we have the youth, they say we have this, this, and that. And you know, when, when you actually come here, it's, you know, it's it's a whiteout. For example, we my freshman year, uh, we did 42nd Street. You know, we have beautiful amount of talented people of color. When and you know they showcase, they tell us that when we come in the school, you know we have this, this, and that. But when you see it, it's like, damn, it's 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 only one one like black guy up there. So that's what I mean about token. You know we're used as it's kind of like we're just used for flashy, and you know, but we're not we're not really uh, we're not really being used to our advantage or learning how we, you know, how we should learn. And I know Zetra can, you know, talk about this as well, if I'm, you know, missing out anything, but that was, you know, one experience that was very heavy on the both, the both of us, you know, being students of color at an organization who, you know, they love to praise us behind closed doors, but when it's actually in front of people, you know, it's kind of disappointing and it's kind of, um it's kind of brainwashing you know just to be in an organization just to be in this you know a white supremacist organization who don't who likes to constantly put out trauma for us and not you know and not have and not receive the education that we need so i know for a fact um you know being at point park uh you know all of us felt like a token you know we and you know we felt you know the only the only reason why the school was you know lifted up was you know because of us you know you go to other you go to other organizations such as other these other colleges you know so for example football they're paying their football players because they because they're the they're the people who make the most money and the, they're the reasons why they make the money in the school and at point park you have you know what keeps this school alive is the dance majors and the theater majors and the cinema majors. And you know, we're actually turning down jobs to actually perform for, for uh, we're actually trying to perform, perform on stage and we're doing what other people, what other people on Broadway are doing, you know, and, and we're not, you know, receiving anything from that and we're risking a lot for that. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I have, that's what I have to say about being a token. Um, and I will just say about, uh, this is less a specific anecdote, but for me, the feeling of being tokenized is the cognitive dissonance that arises when I feel that I have to, um, I have to act in a certain way in an institution or in a rehearsal room that is palatable in a like predominantly white culture 
um, you know, I have to act a certain way um, because I know I'm being viewed in a certain way by my white colleagues or, um, you know, by whoever is the authority figure in the room. Um, and at the same time, I have to sort of like proclaim my Egyptianness or my youth or whatever it is um, to advocate for why I deserve to be in that room and why I deserve to be listened to in that space. Um, and that constant um, having to like say, yes, I am this thing, like, you know, I should be here because I am this thing. And then not actually being able to like um, be that thing and actually like fully uh, express those parts of my identity in that space is like, it's a constant cognitive dissonance and it's constantly an inner conflict um, and I think navigating that and trying to compartmentalize and trying to like figure out what to do when gets really, really exhausting. And I think um, the feeling of not being tokenized is when um, all of the things that I, you know, would in some situations feel like I have to be the one person in the room, like, you know, tracking representation of Manasa stories or like tracking like whatever it is um when I'm not the only person thinking about that you know like it doesn't matter if I'm the only person in the room who identifies in that way if other people are thinking about that in a deep and rigorous way so that I get to just like be another voice in the conversation and I have people to bounce off of and I get to say I'm not sure um I don't have this answer like here's this other person I trust in the room who I can like have this conversation with and lean on for support. Like that's what it feels like to not be tokenized. Um, an experience that I have with being tokenized isn't as much of me being tokenized, but me kind of being drawn in by tokenization. Um, at, during my undergraduate experience, I went to a very big university with a graduate program, um, and the graduates are the ones who perform most of the shows. Um, they're the ones who perform most of the shows for the school, and so they are the ones who you go to see the theater performances of. Um, I went to see these performances and immediately noticed the diversity of the cast. I was very excited. There was a lot of people of color, a lot of Latinx people, a lot of people who appeared to be queer. There were a lot of queer stories being told. Um, and so I, I was excited about this. As a queer person, a queer person of color, I was very, very excited. And this helped me make my decision to add theater to my major. I had always been passionate about theater ever since I was in middle school, but I was hesitant going into a college. Um, and I joined theater and I quickly realized that the actors were pretty much the limit of where that representation was present. There was a lot of actors of color, um, a lot of actors of color, and that was pretty much it. Um, I can remember in my four years of college experience, only one teacher of color um, for a, um, and he wasn't a hired on staff, he was a guest teacher for a specific class. Um, there, I do not think any of the shows that I saw were directed or produced, and the only people of color again, were students. The only people of color who were um, designers were students who were, because of that, designing for free because of the, or more accurately, paying to be a part of the school and then designing their shows for them. Um, so it was this kind of thing where it's wonderful to see yourself represented on stage, and that's a really, really great thing, and it's very exciting, but it's, it feels hollow when you realize that all of the people putting these people in these parts are white people. It's white people making the decisions, white people choosing the shows, white people casting it. Everything other than the actual acting is not being done by the voices that the plays and that the school advocates for and says that it's preaching. So it's this kind of, it's like May said, this dissonance and this kind of very active feeling of being used for a being used for a purpose and it's a it's a purpose you agree with I'm happy to hear them championing diversity and happy to hear them championing these things but I wish that it was the actual 
people doing it as opposed to white people doing it and being praised for it. Yeah, and I think we see, um, thank you for sharing that. And I think we see so much of like those, those uh, similar dynamics in um, how uh, youth are treated like within uh, sort of theater institutions too, where um, it's like a similar thing. The people who actually have power are not the young people. Like you may like come in and see like an apprentice program full of like, you know, 10, 15 people who are like your peers and, and, um, uh, and then, you know, you, you get there and, and maybe you don't have as much agency as you might hope. And there is that dissonance. Yeah. Where, um, you're like showing up, like to offer your youth and also not allowed to, um, hold power in a lot of ways. Um, and th yeah, Magdalene. Um, to speak on that a little more as somebody who's under 18 and also somebody who's white and has immense privilege in my day-to-day -day life, I'm usually the kind of person that you do see when you think of, when you see teens in positions of power in board meetings and stuff like that, because I, like when I talk to friends who join in board meetings or the teen representatives of organizations, they're usually people who look a lot like me and I don't, and there's only usually one or two of us in board meetings and in boardrooms and in institutional positions of power as people under 18. And I think that that's a problem is just having, uh, looking at me and thinking, oh, she's gonna speak for all teenagers now. And we don't need to include more diverse teen voices in our programming. And I think that's just something that I wish I could see more of in organizations is having peers that look more like the teens that these theaters are trying to program for in, in these positions of power. I'm wondering if, uh, it's like I'm also thinking about um, uh, Eric Liu's keynote, keynote um, plenary yesterday um, and the incredible uh, sort of folks we heard this afternoon in the plenary and um, sort of holding this, the fact of um, like the difficulty of, of these kinds of positions and the tokenization and also this idea that like we all have power, power is infinite. Um, and maybe, yeah, there's like all these different ways to hold power. So I'm wondering if anyone wants to share about how, how you've uh, uh, found ways to, to hold power even within uh, these systems that are trying to take it away from us. I feel like, um... Wait, that was a question, right? Yeah, I feel like that um, in this day and age, I feel like that, you know, us young people, we just, I think we've come to a point where we just need to create for ourselves and create a seat for our table at this, you know, a, create a seat for us at the table. You know, I think that, yeah, we can, you know, like we can sit up here. Like one thing that I learned at Point Park we know we can sit up here and cry and you know sit up here and say that we want this and that for the shows we want this we want this we want this but you know at the end of the day they're only looking at us in like an they're only looking at us as product you know that because we have to i feel like that we have to get to a point where we need to think like them on their level and you know start messing with their money when you start messing with that you know, that's when they start shivering, you know, that's when they start shivering. So I feel like that in order for, in order for us to, you know, go along, go long ways, I feel like we just have to create something for ourselves. And, you know, for example, um, there is Tyler Perry. I always say this, Ty, I don't, I don't like none of Tyler Perry's works. I, I hate it. However, he's come to a point where he's create a he's create a, a seat for himself he has like a bigger studio than like warner bro like warner bros is something and then when you look at his work it's like whoa you know you know what's there's a disconnect you know it's just the type of people he's um you know he's he's created him a seat at the table around people who's gonna you know who he knows for a fact 
he's going to grab their attention, you know, which is a uh, majority African Americans, you know. And so, you know, I feel like just by that example, you know, we just need to create these roles for ourselves and create, um, you know, create that theater company, write that script, you know, direct that show, do whatever you want, you know, there's no limit, you know, nobody's stopping any of us at the end of the day. And so, and I know, uh, you know, Zetra can, you know, speak more on it since, since like we've been, um, you, cause you know, the reason why I'm, you know, doing what I'm doing is really because of, you know, Zetra, you know, I wanted to perform first, but I did, I had to tell myself, do I really want to, you know, wait for a check from another old white man or do I want to build something for myself? Do I want to create something that can be big for myself and create a change? I'm going with that. Yeah, I guess I can, I guess I can talk from that. Um, yeah, so I, I just, pers I personally think that, you know, just being around a lot of young people, we kind of do this thing where it's like, how are we going to educate ourselves enough to be accepted? How are we going to find the biggest vocabulary, do as much research as possible where they take us serious? Ka, 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 ka. And it's like, you can just be yourself. You can, you're educated enough to do exactly what they're doing, if so more. Um, and like I keep saying, I, I keep saying this, I think COVID is a blessing. I think COVID is a blessing because COVID times is a youth time, is a youth era. Um, we just have this thing where older people just have no idea what they're doing. It's, and, and just like how older people, they have, they have stuff where young people, we have no idea what they're doing. So there, there can just be a thing where you can just do your own thing, you know, and everybody can be accepted and seen. There's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of question uh, when youth, when youth are being accepted into higher power positions. Granted, you know, granted, I do understand how older people and old, and how others feel when, you know, some, if like someone comes after, tries to do like artistic director, and then you look at a resume and it's like, okay, but what kind of money did you ever send in anywhere else? That's understandable, but being able to be underneath uh, and working underneath other people, I feel for youth is is something that should be seen and should be spotlighted. If we can't, if if theaters can't afford being able to um, pay for uh, internships, um, that's I just feel like money is just such sometimes an excuse uh, where it's. You know, maybe some, maybe maybe since you know every single year you have you do not have the funds to give to internships. Well, guess what? If you know that's going to happen every single year, do a benefit concert every single year. Do do something that will always bring bring in profit. Do GoFundMe and know that hey, this money is going to be for my interns when they when they come in the next upcoming. Um, I just think sometimes when it comes to youth, we're not necessarily seen as important or seen as, okay, get the job done, and then someday you'll be able to do what I'm doing. No, we can make our own, we can make our own table, not even a seat. We can make our own table, we can make our own conference hall, we can do this and much more. Um, and that way, you know, when the old people have questions, they'll come and ask us and, and we won't be turning the cheek, we'll help them as well. But sometimes, you know, the young have to lead. And I think after COVID, no time is better than the present. I hear that a lot. It's like, I'll hear it from my friends too, saying, oh, I'm not, I don't know enough to be paid yet, I'm still learning. And I think that's so true in a lot of ways. I think that college and higher education gives us a lot of tools to use, but I also think that age doesn't determine your ability to tell stories and to create art and to play in a community with other people. 
And I believe that being paid for the work that I do, one, makes it easier for me because school is a, a job in so many ways. It takes up so much time and energy. And it also teaches me to value my time differently. And I think that's important for young people to know going into the field is that they should be prioritizing their time and their energy. They should know that it's worth something and so they won't give it away so easily and they know that they I don't know we're just teaching people that they have that worth and that they deserve to be paid for what they do I think a lot of that attitude of I'm not ready I don't deserve to be paid yet um, comes from the way that educational systems function within theater where there are people who are getting paid but they aren't the ones doing the bulk of the work. Um, the are like in, this was true in high school and even more so in college, you are paying, you um, in, in college specifically, not in high school, you are paying to be a part of this theater company, which is the school. And you are paying to take these classes, which are putting on the shows, doing the design work. You are paying to do all of these things. And then they're getting a show that gets the money and you don't get any of it. You pay to take on these jobs. And sometimes they pay actual, they pay actual adult actors to come in and do parts alongside you. There are people doing the exact same work you're doing and you are paying to do who are getting paid for that work. It's this kind of system that inherently devalues what you're doing just because you are learning from it. Um, and we are learning from it, but I would argue that everyone is constantly learning, especially in the world of theater. It's not something where you have reached the point and then you stop learning all of your theatrical skills and you, you are a theater practitioner and you're ready to do theater. It is a gradual process and we are learning as students. And despite ca and capitalist systems non-withstanding and having to pay for college and all of this stuff I do not agree with at its core, there should be some kind of reward for doing something that brings in money for this school. We are putting on a show, that show is making them money, and none of that goes to us. We are still the ones who are putting in money to get them more money. And it just kind of breeds this mindset of, I need to, I am not good enough. I am not there yet. And what there constitutes is constantly getting higher and higher and seeming more and more unattainable for a lot of young people. Um, I will just briefly add, everyone has spoken on this so beautifully, but I will just add um, in terms of wielding power, um, I think every single person in theater is there because someone else went to bat for them and someone else brought them in somehow. And I think that's a power that I take very seriously is that even if I am the, you know, even if I'm not an authority figure in any real way, like I have the power to advocate for a writer or an artist who I believe in. And, um, you know, I think all of us have that. I think that young people so often get into this scarcity mentality of like, they have to be competitive and it's every man for themselves and they have to only be looking out for themselves. And actually um, no one makes a career in theater just on their own. Like no one does it without resources that someone else was generous enough to share with them or without someone else who advocated to get them into a certain space. And um, I think all of us have the power to um, share information with a younger person. All of us have the power to um, share resources and opportunities with other people. All of us have the power to tell uh, people we know who are working in theater about um, artists who we believe in. And that's something that I take really seriously. Um, I think so much can be achieved through mentorship. Like, you know, I think, yes, pay your interns, pay them hourly, pay them for exactly as much work as they do. But also once they're there, like, mentor them really, really well and make them fall in love with working in theater. Because um, I think a lot of theaters, you know, hire a lot of um, young BIPOC arts workers and then have so much trouble retaining them. And there's kind of a revolving door effect. And I think our industry has a lot of trouble retaining these brilliant minds 
because um, even if they're getting paid, which most of the time they aren't getting paid enough, um, they don't get the mentorship they need to really be able to see themselves in that authority position one day. So, um, you know, if like, if you are a gatekeeper at some theater or you are a decision maker, a power holder of any race, it's like, how are you mentoring the other people um, around you? How are you um, making, how are you empowering those entry level people? Are you listening to them when they bring their opinion to the floor? Um, and I think that, it, like, I think that's the work of equity and inclusion. I really do think it comes down to mentorship and listening and making sure you're doing that in a way that's meaningful to the other person. And I think all of us um, should feel empowered to ask for that if we're not getting that in, you know, internships, entry level jobs, whatever it is, even as actors in a production. I so appreciate all of that. And I, uh, thinking about this idea of like learning, um, it like breaks my brain the way that, like how little we value learning, right? Like, wh like why aren't we, why would it be, why is it so wrong to like pay people to learn, you know? And like, why, why do we think that just because someone's learning? Yeah, I, I think that there's such a, um, through our relationship to learning, I think we really need to evaluate. And I think that the other piece of that, that makes me think about this mentorship question too, um, is when we talk about learning and like these uh, apprenticeships and fellowships in school, right? There's like an end point where we'll have learned all the things and it is one directional and it is like sort of uh, brainwashing us into the white supremacist structures of how these theaters are supposed to work. Um, and I think that um, to me, part of like what reimagining mentorship like could look like is making it, yeah, it is, it has to be a two-way street, which um, folks were talking about this afternoon too. Like, how can we sort of think about uh, all of our like supervisors as people who are also learning, you know? Um, and I think about like ourselves as people who have valuable, valuable uh, knowledge and, and contributions, you know? Um, which I guess maybe brings me to another question, um, which I'm excited about, um, for us to just like dream a bit. Um, like, I wonder if we could imagine what it could look like to have these sort of pathways into the field, um, that actually value us um, and like what it could look like to see youth as an asset and not as a risk, um, to see youth in power specifically as an asset um, and what it could look like to sort of have, have spaces where young people and young BIPOC folks and young queer folks feel safe and accepted and welcome. Um, yeah, I guess what are our wildest dreams for the theater industry? I know for, um, I mentioned this yesterday, is having a more so having, I mentioned yesterday how young people, we are, it's, it is, it's like we're brainwashed into thinking that, you know, we need to perform first and then get to a love, like a business level of things, you know, because I, I felt like, you know, looking back at it when I was like choosing my colleges, I'm like, I feel, I felt brainwashed, you know, because, you know, for me, I feel like young people were trained to know that, oh, Broadway's the big thing and we're gonna make money when we get there, there, there. It's just by performing, but nobody's actually looking at, you know, oh no, you know, the lead ain't the person who gets the money, it's the, executive the producer you know it's whoever is like in these leadership roles and so um i feel like that there's not really you know there's not really a a degree like where you, or like a bachelor's degree or something like that into you know learning the learning like uh arts entrepreneurship because i feel like that's you know that's a field 
that uh, that's very specific, you know? And so I feel like an arts entrepreneurship, I like a bachelor's in that instead of like waiting to get your master's or something like that. I feel like that that should be as big or that should hold as much weight as a musical theater degree or an acting degree, you know? Cause realistically, you really don't need, you don't need those degrees to make it. There are people who's, there are people who are make who are making just as much money acting with no training at all, you know, training. And so, you know, I feel like that we have to build, we have to build something, you know, uh, in the college system that's geared towards the business and in the arts, you know, instead, you know, I feel like waiting for your masters or something like, I, like, why can't I get this training now? You know, and it's possible to get that training now, but it's kind of like you have to do your own research and so, you know, I was performing, but I had to do my own research, you know, in, in uh, like just entrepreneurship in the arts and make my own network and just, and, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I just wish that we had a degree that holds as much weight as like a performing degree. A dream that I have for future theater and theater organizations is, I keep talking about teens, but I am one, so is to prioritize reaching out to teenagers and making the theater a space where all teenagers feel like they belong. I think it would be amazing for more accessible ticket prices for young people and more programming that's designed to specifically target young people who don't typically find themselves in the theater. And I also think it would be so amazing if we could connect Teen, if we could have more teen groups in theaters speaking for the teenagers that they go to school with and also if we can connect these groups of young people across the nation kind of like TCG but for people under 18 so that we can start building these connections and these relationships with each other and having these conversations on a smaller scale because the same issues that we're facing in national theater we're facing in smaller teen groups and we don't talk about these issues because we don't talk about teen groups and um, young people programming. And so I think that would be super awesome. Um, sorry, people are raising their hands. Okay, I guess I'll go. <laughs> I, so first of all, I dream of a world where um, theaters pay their uh, interns and part-time staff, you know, hourly and also uh, contribute to healthcare and just um, put all of the benefits in place that we young people need to not feel like our lives are precarious. Um, because I think the year of 2020 showed a lot of people like, you know, your internship where you're making just enough money to live off of is great until 2020 happens or a personal catastrophe happens or whatever it is. So, um, you know, we part of feeling valued is knowing that your livelihood is not precarious and it's not contingent on everything going exactly perfectly. Um, and I think that also includes if you don't have enough money to pay your intern hourly, um, make it a part time thing so that they can find other jobs that will also pay them hourly. Um, so that um, outside of internships, um, I think something that I have learned from dramaturgy is that um, reading a play isn't about like, you know, sitting there and critiquing like, well, this, this uh, plot device doesn't work and this scene was confusing and it's not about picking out the flaws. It's about seeing the play for what it could be on stage one day. Um, and it's about seeing the potential for growth and um, seeing like, okay, what is this person's idea? What is at the heart of this? Um, and really like stripping away all the judgment so that the voice and the heart of the writer can shine through. And like, I would love to see a more dramaturgically caring approach taken to um, how we welcome people into this field. You know, like I think that if people were looking at resumes and applications and instead of saying like, oh, well, this person doesn't have enough experience, if they were expanding their idea of what counts as relevant experience, if they were, instead of critiquing like, oh, this cover letter isn't perfect, if they were thinking about like, what are the different kinds of creativity and problem solving 
um, that are relevant. I mean, I think most of my uh, good theater administrative skills come from working in food service, but I would never want to talk about that in a job interview because there's stigma around that. But like, what if we did consider that um, a valuable qualification for working in theater admin? So um, yeah, seeing people for their potential for growth, um, actually empowering them to grow into that potential through good mentorship and expanding our idea of who is qualified to be in this industry. Yeah, I, I think um, for me, I would love to, um, I wish theaters and schools would teach about money. Like that's something where they, what they don't teach about. They, they teach about, oh my gosh, you can make it on stage and then you get it on, you get on stage. And this isn't just for young generation. This is, I'm calling old generation out too, because old generation was young at once. And and, you know, everybody went through that, everyone went through that phase where it's, you know, I, I feel that passion on stage. I want to get to on stage. They get to on stage and it's like, oh, I feel something else. I want to be a producer. I want to do this, that, and the third. And then once they get to those positions, then they start thinking about money, but no one thinks about money from the jump. And I think that's really where, really how, you know, a lot of theater, just theater in general, kind of found its way where theater is today. And if we can teach about money just in general, I think it would just go so much further. Theater industry would go so much further. Um, but a, a lot of times we get stuck within our passion and we get trapped within reality. Uh, and then we have to create reality and we have to somehow make real reality work. And there's, and that's not me saying there's nothing wrong with, you know, what we do. I love what we do. That's why I do it. But I feel that's, I feel that um, just, you know, the, the, the pyramid, the pyramid is so, it's so ridiculously foul against the art, the art industry. Um, the art industry, just performers ourselves, it's so low. We even when you get to Broadway, it seems like so much money because we've never seen that much money. But in the, but in then in reality, in reality, is not that much money. And uh, so when money when money is being taught, then that's when strategy can be taught. And and I feel I feel that's when things can make do and make happen. And we wouldn't really be struggling like the way that we're struggling now. We wouldn't really have to complain that we're not paying each other for different types of things. And this is conversation that can be taken this way or that way. But at the end of the day, whenever you sign up for schools for, for and, and it's not even just for theater, it's for a lot of majors, you know, and that's, that's just the hierarchy. They don't teach you about money. So that way, when you do get into positions, you have to figure it out. But what if they did teach about money in schooling, in colleges, for theater people? It'd be different. We'd be in a whole different society, a whole different world. Um, so I would say that um, if you, if people would put that into um, maybe, maybe that's something a part of um, theater programs where it's like, hey, we're going to teach, we're going to teach our students, or we're going to teach the people who cross through here, how money works, and how, and how things can happen new, and, and we don't have to be stuck in our old ways. This is something that we can bring fresh and new into um, the industry. So yeah. Uh, in our in our theater programs and in like the internships and fellowships, all of our professional development stuff too. Like, it would be, um, yeah, we should be talking about money. We should be transparent about how it operates at our institutions. Um, love to hear it, um, Maddie. Yeah, something that I is truly just discussing how the industry works in general. Money is a huge part of it, but. I graduated with a degree from a from a fairly big name university. I graduated from the University of Washington um, with a degree in performance. And I graduated with truly no idea how to break into the field of theater. Um, 
we had a kind of a major seminar where we discussed what to do with your degree going into the future. And the entirety of those discussions were about how to use your, your degree to apply for non-theater jobs. Um, it was entirely about how to like be like, oh, I'm good um, at public speaking. I have good time management skills, which are true things about the theater, but I have no idea. I don't know anything about equity, about actors unions, about all of these things that are central. And I, I, I've heard about them all throughout my college career and I continue to hear about them now that I've graduated. I will admit, I have no idea what any of that means. Um, I don't know how it works. I don't know how it functions. And it's obvious that that's central to, to making these things work, to being a part of it. And then you also get to the point where bigger theater positions require so much experience that it feels nearly impossible to, and to get into them. And then it goes back into the kind of thing where it's like, how do you find a position that gets you enough money? How do you build up to that level? Um, something that always strikes me on Broadway is when they have teenage characters or characters in their 20s played by 30 to 40 year old people. Um, because I know for a fact that there are people of those ages who are sufficiently talented to take on those roles who would absolutely love to do it, but they just aren't permitted. They aren't let through the door because they don't have years and years of this experience. They don't have all of this kind of stuff built up. And it gets even more so once you start adding on um, minority aspects to it, queer aspects to it. I what name a single big name non-binary actor on the stage. I truly cannot think of any. Um, it is, and that is something that you either have to hide when you go into these positions or something that will bar you entirely from the system. So it's this kind of thing where I wish, if I'm being honest, there's a great deal of me that kind of wishes that we didn't have put to list experience at all um, when, when auditioning for jobs. Um, that might be a bit of a stretch, obviously, but this is dreams. Um, I think basing someone off of the quality of their performance and who they are as a person and whether you think that they resonate with you and with the cast is something that would be beneficial. And there's always the idea of, oh, they can give us our experience, but we won't base it solely off of that. But I think there's so much unconscious bias, especially in the way that society kind of hones us into these things, where just basing it off of someone's, not basing it off their age, not basing it off what they've done before, but just basing it off of who they are. And if there are things that they don't know because they haven't broken into the industry yet, we can teach them because we see that they have the potential, they have they resonate with us. They're going to be a good fit for this show and we will help make them a good fit for the show. Even if they don't know all of the intricacies of these things, even if they aren't union. I, again, I have no idea what that means. So maybe that's not a correct thing to say in the circumstance, but it's just these kinds of things where it's so daunting. Yeah, I so appreciate that, Maddie. Because I think that, um, I, I feel like something that I've experienced and I'm sure many of us have experienced um, is, you know, um, this feeling that there's just so much that I don't know um, about how the industry works, about these unions, about like what a budget looks like. And that's like on the one hand, yes, <laughs> that knowledge has been like specifically like, uh, uh, what's the word, obfuscated? Is that the word I'm looking for? Okay, um, kept away, okay. Um, but like, and I think that that's sort of used to um, like, thank you, Annalisa, um, to um, make you feel like you don't have anything to offer. It's like, well, if I don't know exactly how uh, this thing, this ex like the granular details of how this works, then I can't possibly have a, a valuable um, contribution to like how we can reimagine it. Um, but in fact, I think it might be the opposite. You know, like I think that, um, and we're sort of at time, so I'm gonna to start to wrap us up. But um, I think that what feels so powerful in, in young, in like these young voices in this space together is 
like because we are coming in with without like so many of the assumptions that people already have about how the industry works and is supposed to work, um, we can sort of see beyond it and we can see the world in which, yeah, maybe you don't need to list your experience in order to like audition for a thing or apply for a job, you know, and like we can like see these possibilities. Um, and I think just to offer my, <laughs> my response to the question, um, it's like my sort of secret, not secret hope for one way that um, we could be inviting young people into the industry is um, I guess like a dream tank, uh, you know, rather than like a cohort of like underpaid labor, we could have a cohort of people who we pay really like well, like appropriately for the, and listen to, like look to guide us, um, to like dream for us, with us. Um, and I think cohorts of young people dreaming together feels like the future. Um, so with that, I think we are at time. I want to make space for any final words. Um, if anyone has any like 10 second shout out. Um, otherwise, it's been lovely. And I'll hand it back to TCG folks. <laughs> I had to add myself in because I wanted to come on and thank you all. Um, do offer those last words, but as a curator, just of this space, I wanted to just honor and affirm all of the beautiful things that you have shared in this space. And I'm so appreciative of the knowledge and that like I've gained the way that I have been also like, <laughs> y'all said a lot of things that I was like, seen, thank goodness, like somebody is speaking for the, the experiences that I'm continuing to have and also like, also feel like I cannot admit to because of the ways that that keeps me as a young person in the field from continuing to build my positional power and continuing to build my own agency. Um, and I, I just appreciate uh, the tremendous amount of vulnerability that, it, that, that that takes and honesty that that takes. You all are so wonderful. Um, so I will now stop in that affirmation if you do have any last words before we close out this space. I just want to say thank you. It was an honor to speak with everyone today and to hear your thoughts and amazing ideas. I second Magdalene's sentiment. Thank you guys. This was really beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And Zetra and Albert, could we also get like a link of where to find your, your theater company and how we can support you? Sweet. Love that, cool. <laughs> awesome, well, for all those still on, thank you so much for joining us. I will vocally say, again, your words have power. So if you can take a moment to fill out the session review forms for all of the sessions that you attended today, let us know how we did in curating these spaces, how all of our young folks today did affirm them. We will send messages of love, um, know that we program the future based on your feedback and based on the community, right? So if you gas us up, maybe you'll see more programming like this in the future. Um, this is the last um, public session of today. If you are an under 30 human or a 30-ish human who's looking for some coalition building space, there's one more happy hour at the end, but otherwise this concludes week one of TCG's virtual conference. I hope to see so many of you back next week.